Can I tell you something funny? I had I had the most boring possible quarantine thought the other day, um, and I'm yes. almost, I'm almost proud of it in a way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's here it is. Uh, I'm really enjoying putting ice in my water. <laughs> It's the most boring beverage. It's the most boring addition to the beverage. But hey, hey look, here I am. I have it right here. Look at that. It's, it's the small things. A delight to the senses. I, I'm proud of you, Edwin. I mean, treat here yourself, Here I am, man. walking, a real daredevil, walking the tightrope hey, of life. Yeah, you earned it, man. You, know, you earned it. Suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous beverages. You know, I mean, it must be a real pain refilling the ice tray all the time, though. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> you don't know the half of it. Okay. Out of paper, out of stock. There's friendly faces around the block. Break loose from the chains that are causing you pain. Call Michael and Stanley, Jim Dwight Creed, call Andy and Kelly. If your business paper needs or Dunder Mifflin, the people versus paper people, Dunder Mifflin, the people versus paper people, Dunder Mifflin, the people. Hello and welcome to the Michael Scott Podcast Company, a show for fans of The Office by fans of The Office. I'm your host and candle maker, Sean Roney. And I'm Edwin Jaynes, Dundee Award winner. And with us as always, our producer in the warehouse, Mr. Alex Ward. Sometimes I will just stand here and watch television for hours. I love it. <laughs> I love this TV. I love this TV. <laughs> Every week we get together and talk about our favorite show, NBC's The Office, and I am so excited to talk about an iconic episode today, Dinner Party. Somehow, some way, we have missed doing this episode so far. So this is one of the signature episodes, if not the signature episode of the entire show, uh, with some of the most memorable lines, moments, biggest laughs, most awkward moments. Uh, I'm, I'm stoked to get into it. Let's do this it. This is the big it, tuna, the big one. It, <laughs> it's true. It's, it's, it's such a great- 185 pounder. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, man. It's such a great episode. And I don't know if we've missed it or we've been saving it till this point. Um, but uh, I, I'm just so excited. Well, we haven't Dinner missed it. I mean, you know. No, no. We've mentioned it a lot. We Sometimes we do just episodes about episodes, you know. And, and I think somebody emailed us recently. Oh, shoot. I'm going to have to pull that up to give them a shout out. Somebody recently emailed us and was just like, can you please do Dinner Party? I, oh, yeah. I just need yeah. it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, yeah, yeah. Like, we've had a couple of those. Like, yeah. Yeah. We've had a few people yeah. ask us, been like, what, so are you, what are you guys doing? You're just like. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you know what? Is, now that we're all kind of stuck at home, it's the perfect time to talk about this episode where they're all stuck at Michael's Trapped. home. Trapped. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Dinner Party, uh, season four, episode 13. It aired on April 10th, 2008, written by episode Lee. Episode nine Ad of season four. Am I crazy? Uh, oh, no, the double episodes. That's right. I forgot. Episode, yeah, yeah, it is, is there, technically the thirteenth episode. They use the two numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But best. that's a good point. That's a good point. But maybe the ninth uh, episode. Season four is all messed up. Yeah. Oh, and we will get into that for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it aired on April tenth, two thousand eight, written by Lee Eisenberg and Gene Stupnitsky, and directed by the great Paul Feig. Paul Feig back in the saddle. Yeah, I think one thing to kind of keep in mind uh, for this episode is there's a fantastic oral history of The Office that was published in Rolling Stone uh, two years ago as part of its 10th anniversary. And that same oh, yeah. selection, um, you know, it's written by the same guy, Andy Green, or published, I suppose, or collected. Um, and Andy Green just released this, uh, you know, this book, The Office, The Untold Story of the Greatest Sitcom of the 2000s. Um, and I've been making my way through it. I think, uh, you know, we'll probably talk about it a little bit more on the show as we go along. But there's a ton of... The, can you hold that up for the, the YouTube viewers? <laughs> I, have it, I have it with me, but I don't have the book jacket on it. Oh, okay. So, ah, what I, nice. what I you like some, to take the jacket we can, off. You can yeah. look at that, yeah. <laughs> what I it was humid biting. today, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, take the jacket off. But anyway, it adds a ton of little depth and color and anecdotes and small details to help round out uh, what we know about this episode, what we know about the show. So I'll maybe try to mention things that uh, yeah. kind of help with that as we go. But yeah, Pepper in some details. Yeah, I like it. Well, I think, I think right off the bat, um, I would love to address, you know, the, the coming about of this episode, because w what was really interesting during this time 
um, you know, 2007, 2008, season four, is that uh, the writer's strike happened. Uh, the Writers Guild of America strike of 2007, 2008. It started in November 5th of 2007 and it lasted until February uh, 12th of 2008. Um, 12,000 uh, film and television screenwriters of, uh, of the Writers Guild of America unions uh, went on strike. And, um, you know, the office in particular, Steve Carell being a WGA member, uh, as soon as the strike began, he was like, I'm not going to work. You know, we, we won't even shoot the scripts that we already have on, on hand. Um, so, uh, yeah, everyone on the office went dark for four months and people were really itching to get back, um, back to work in February. When, when the strike was lifted, Greg Daniels was at work that day. Another thing about the writer's strike is it really contributed to the sort of truncated nature of this season. So you see a ton of double episodes, um, like you mentioned before, Alex, or hour longs, you know, the show kind of playing with that format in part because uh, I think there's a quote from Jenna Fisher where she says she thinks they lost like six or seven episodes, which is only to say I think that they either got combined or, you know, brought back later in the series run, but uh, it made, it had a huge impact on the show. Right. I mean, we didn't get a Christmas episode this season. We didn't, you know, a lot of those, I mean, there were, there was certainly that kind of holiday chunk of, uh, of episodes we missed out on, but, uh, but boy, it, they, they came back uh, with a fury. <laughs> I think they really an did. another thing that just, I mean, this is part of this, but I think part of the reason that dinner party stands out so much from the rest of the series or uh, in comparison to the rest of the series, maybe is because the location is so unique the context in which it was shot um, and bringing all the writers and actors back uh, was very unique. And it's, it's so it really stands out. Uh, all those things contributed to this great episode. Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's like coming back, it's like out of the frying pan into the fire with this thing because you have all this time off through the office and then it's like the world is turned upside down and just shoved down your throat and you can't escape this house with them. And it's so different from the show. We talked about this before recording. There's no B storylines, really. It's the plot, the plot just moves every single scene. There's incredible momentum throughout this entire episode. It never slows down. And it boils to like, I was, I was, I watched it several times and each time I thought a diff at a different point, oh, this is the climax of the episode. It's like, there's so many times it, the tension just swells and then kind of simmers again and then swells again and it eventually blows over in a few ways. But are you talking man. about the Asabuco? That It's a braise, Alex. It's a braise. Yeah. You know, in Spain, sometimes they'll wait till midnight to eat. How could you say that, Edwin? You know I have soft teeth. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it just, I don't know. It, the, the episode is a masterpiece uh, of, of comedy writing, of the acting, of just, and, and, and like, I've said this before on the show, everyone is having so much fun while time. they're making this and you, it's palpable. You can tell. It's just, I think, having I, a great time. I think there's something to, you know, what the episode is, but something to also them just being so glad to be back at work. Yeah. And, um, and uh, there's some great improvised moments in the show. In, or in this episode. And uh, I think there was, you know, I read that there was kind of like a loose, more loose um, um, energy on set um, as they kind of slowly started to, to come back after this uh, four month hiatus. But, um, but let's get into uh, the episode, Dinner Party, cold open. Right, we've got Michael Scott um, telling everybody like, sorry, we gotta work late. And he goes straight to Jim and says, Jim, like, you know, we got any plans tonight? And he's like, no, you told us not to. And then we get that great moment this from Michael. Michael Scott. <laughs> Scranton. He's got to clarify. These people are my friends and I care about them. <laughs> it's so uh, good. He does a thing that's always bothers me in movies when people talk on the phone and you don't hear the other side and they're just moving way too fast. You're like, that's yeah. just not how phone calls go. It escalates so fast. Like, everyone in that office would know that he's not talking to anyone. <laughs> just He just immediately picks up the phone and just starts talking. It's like, yeah. he's not talking oh, yeah. to anybody. I, lo that's I love that nobody oh. questions it because it's five o'clock on Friday. <laughs> it's right, just like, yes. that, I don't, that was definitely fake, but I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. That's one of the uh, all-time great fake phone calls in the show. The other one that I love is in season six where Michael says, well, you just tell the mayor he lost six votes. All right, <laughs> yeah. me too. Yeah. There's, <laughs> yes. There's a or, tiny, hiya, buddy. I, there's a tiny, <laughs> tiny moment in this cold open when Michael almost like 
he's he's like double checking making sure that jim is free tonight and he asks him again he follows up and he's yeah. like you know did you do you have anything going on tonight and he's just he's making sure before he pulls the trigger on his, on his master plan here. And there's just a look on Steve Curl's face when Jim's like, Nope, you told us not to. And he kind of turns away from Jim with like clearly so excited, but acting like it's just like, ah, it's finally time to execute this plan. I can't wait. I, so I was reading on uh, the Dunderpedia page in the trivia section. This episode had been foreshadowed for several episodes. The writers insist inserted, a reference into nearly every episode, um, but most of them ended up getting cut for, for this kind of idea that Michael is always asking them to dinner. In launch party, Michael had invited Jim and Pam to dinner, but Jim says they can't, uh, and both of them feign disappointment. In money, Jim and Pam accept Michael's earlier offer to have them come over for dinner, uh, you know, knowing that um, he won't be able to. That part is in the in that episode of Money when they're like, "Come on, you know, we can get together, mm -hmm. play Billy Joel <laughs> guitar, yeah. Billy Joel rock <laughs> band, and play with yeah. our baby." We yeah. get catering from Hooters. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, anyways, they, I think I think that this was supposed to be a little bit more like of an ongoing joke, and some of the scenes got deleted. Sure. But we find out that he's not nine times, nine times he's uh, asked Jim and Pam to dinner. Seems like a low number over the years, uh, but I guess they haven't been a couple that long. So maybe that's true. That's true. It's that, a, we're guess, only halfway considering through that they've only been dating. That's probably actually a lot of, a lot of times to ask yeah. a new couple to dinner. I love the way that he corners Jim without giving him that split second that Jim needs to come up with an excuse. You said you didn't have plans. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, it's, Perfect. It's one of these great times too, where it's like Michael, he doesn't want to have dinner with you. Like, yeah. why are you? Like, yeah. why do you? Like, you know, you're tricking him into doing it. It's so, Jim, but Jim is Jim's like just the Steph Curry of coming up with excuses, and so you can't give him any space, or he's gonna find room <laughs> to shoot and get an excuse off. Oh, and so sure. Michael is right in his face, and he's just like, "You said you didn't have plans," and Jim yeah. knows immediately. He's just like. I'm starting to suspect there was no call. It's like, you already knew that. You totally knew that. <laughs> so good. It is, you know what? It is Michael being so eager to get them to come over too, though. Makes, um, on the one hand, you're like, man, why does he want to be friends with these people who don't want to be friends with him? But on the other hand, we learn maybe why Michael doesn't want to have dinner alone with Jan anymore. <laughs> well, we also learn why you would reject Michael's offer nine times. Oh, well, that we learned, like, I'm not we going to that. dinner at Michael's house, but like, I had have uh, I guess Michael have Michael and Jan been living together as long as Jim and Pam have been dating. So, yeah, I mean, ostensibly, right at the beginning of the series, it opens right. with Jan asleep in Michael's in their shared bedroom, and you know, Michael says, uh, "Oh, that's right, you're this right. Is yeah. What, yeah. <laughs> right. This is what I wake up to. Jan yeah. made me breakfast this morning while she bought the milk. Right. <laughs> that's right." One of, um, one of many glamorous shots of Jan that we get over the course. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, let, uh, so after, after that, after um, uh, Jim and Pam are clearly tricked into going to uh, Michael and Jan's house for dinner, um, we get them Andy showing. And Andy and Angela are not Andy, tricked. Ew. They, ew. <laughs> <laughs> just get one of those. And Dwight is not invited, Harsh. which is, you know, that, that, that one hurts. Um, but he overcomes. So anyways, we, we get to um, Jim and Pam come and arrive at, uh, at Michael and Jan's. Uh, they get a, uh, and we go pretty much straight into the tour. I do love that moment where, um, you know, Pam brings over the bottle of wine and Jan is like, oh, this would be great to cook with, um, which is just the beginning of Jan versus Pam. <laughs> and there's, there's a whole sort of dynamic within this entire episode, which is that you don't really know what's coming from Jan, where she's very pleasant on the surface, but there's a real intensity that's behind all of her emotions and expressions. And um, I think you get it at every step of the way. And it's easy to forget that she used to be their boss. And yeah. they all have that sort of complication thing with her. And um, I just think it plays out so many times over the course of the episode. And, and we, her smile is just like stapled into the corners of her mouth because uh, she's just grinning through it all. And like like you said, that moment with the wine, that's, that's exactly that time before she says that wine comment, that's exactly how long it's a normal dinner party. 
which is when they walk in, the small talk they have, oh, so glad we're finally able to do this. Oh, can you get their coats, babe? Sure, babe. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, it's normal for about eight to nine seconds. And then she hands her the wine and she gets this backhand comment to Pam. That's Already, you know. <laughs> things are just like, this isn't going to We're off well. to the races. Yeah, here we I, go. I, I'm going to say it now because I'm going to keep bringing it up. But okay. Melora Hardin is the MVP of this episode. Oh. Um, uh, J- the the yeah. actress who plays Jan right Levinson. I, I mean, this episode is about Jan. And she, like, just... I mean, she really kills it. And she really drives... She drives the cringe comedy. She um, has so much subtext in nearly everything she says and does. And you can read it on her face, and it's, it's clear as day. And, uh, and she has some great improvised moments as well. But I just wanted to get that out of the way. No, Laura Hardin it's, it's going to come up it out time and again. It's going to come there, up a lot. In, in, in that sort of oral history, I think it's... Um, Either Eisenberg or Shabnitsky talks about how it's a who, who's afraid of Virginia Wolf kind of oh. concept that they've had sort of brewing for kind of a that while. That is exactly what this episode. And then is. Greg Daniels, I think, says that he compares her to kind of a Greek tragic character who's who's this very smart and capable person, but it's undermined by this one tragic flaw, which is that she is with Michael, <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he sort of leads to her downfall, and she collapses in on herself like a dying star. Right. And she's this person who used to have a lot of power over everyone in that condo and is now at the lowest rung and is feeling the worst about herself that she's ever felt. And that, that part of her makes her extremely tragic of just, man, she's still wearing the clothes, smiling the smile. She's acting the role of who she once was and she knows she's not that anymore. And she's just she's just stuffed with resentment for Michael yeah. in so many ways. And the subtlety with which how Steve Carell and Laura Harden, when they're not talking, when one of them is talking, if you just watch the other person, that's yeah. where the gold in this episode is. It's just the little exasperated looks of just, and, please, I hate this person. And like the the character development that must have gone into their relationship like just everything that they say together say to each other like you know the history you know they've had these arguments before a hundred times you know um about uh it, oh, even man. the way she says can you get their coats babe makes me feel like she made michael practice that before she's like right remember sure get their coats and then he forgets <laughs> so in the good. moments yeah. and she's like Get, can you get yeah. their coats, babe? Like, even that was just felt like, ah, uh, this isn't it's good. It's so good. Yeah. At, at the beginning of the tour, the deleted scenes for this episode are fantastic. They're all really funny and they add so much. <laughs> um, but as they go up the stairs, they ask about how Jan's liking living in Scranton. She says, well, it's not the Upper West Side. And Michael mm. says something to the effect of, well, she's not giving it enough of a chance. She hasn't been to the Anthracite Museum and she hasn't had a hot dog from that new hot dog place. Yeah. <laughs> the new hot dog place. Oh, God. That's great. Well, uh, immediately we kind of move into the tour, right? Yes. You start in the living room. We've got the $200 plasma screen TV. I love this TV. Well, how, how different would the episode have been if they'd actually started with the appetizers? We never saw the app. Mm. What if they all had a little food in their belly before all this? Maybe. Well, maybe that's another, like home to the hangar a little bit. That's <laughs> another. It's another moment from the deleted scene where Michael touches all the appetizers. But anyway. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> um, I just. I mean, this tour is really incredible because there's a couple of things going on. We've. We've. Um, you know, we've seen Michael's condo before, but they've. The. The amount of jam that's been decorated in is is really extraordinary and really tells a fascinating story right mm-hmm. you've got <laughs> she's taken this home and made it a house <laughs> taking this home and made it a house it's like a museum where you're afraid to touch anything which is a really strange way to feel about the place that you live <laughs> Oh my gosh. She's got an Andy Warhol print of herself. That is, and they don't even draw attention to it, really. It's no. insane. You know what? I keep, I've mentioned this so many times already in the deleted scenes. Michael calls that a painting of Jan wearing a bunch of different masks. Yeah. And calls it mask wall. 
<laughs> that's that's just, that's hysterical. Um, that's an Andy and, Dwyer uh, naming right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've also just got like all the candelabras and candles everywhere, which of course is Serenity by Jan. Um, so she's entirely narcissistic, right? She's kind of decorated the place to be all about her. She stuffed Michael's Dundees. <laughs> I love the way that she says it was the neon beer sign or the Dundees. <laughs> Uh, that neon beer sign is the is the gun in the first act of this episode. It's like, wait, mm-hmm. uh, excuse me, St. Paul's. <laughs> I hope I see that later. Uh, I hope I do. <laughs> oh my gosh! We also see in the tour they go to the bedroom and we see kind of this first peek at you know Jim and Pam having to bear witness to a lot of the really strange dynamics between Michael and Jan. The video camera is still set up. The George Foreman grill is in the corner, and then of course we have Michael's. Uh, Michael's little bench. Yeah. And just keep, and he, has see, been, he fits perfect. He's been pushed into the corners of his own house. Mm-hmm. And w- what a great writing structure move, though, to, to have that. To, 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 I mean, starting with the tour is a natural place for the house party. But it really does just absolutely establish every small facet of Michael and Jan's relationship. From the camera, from the like, from what must be the, the only thing holding up their relationship is sex at this point, right? I mean, that's what right. got them together. And that is oh. what is going to break them apart. So it's like, they're still doing that stuff, but, but, but Jan has space, is- space, and- space issues. <laughs> so Michael's <laughs> sleeping on a footrest. It's crazy. And we've already learned previously that they have to watch the tapes back and correct his yeah. form and stuff like that. It's crazy stuff. Oof. And she's got an off Michael, Michael buying a three bedroom condo. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, she's got an office and a workspace and we see, we watch, we watch both Jim and Pam hit, have the smell hit them and essentially gag. Uh, and, and that, that scene there too is again, just like showing Jan's collapsing like a dying star. She's putting everything into this candle business and wants $10,000 for a stake in the business. Yeah. And there's something to and it about- disgusts Michael. The whole thing just disgusts him. And there's we talk about to- how Andy is immediately in and they yeah. never circle back to it. Thought about it. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> there's something too about her workspace that she's like, you know, whenever I'm feeling stressed or anything, I just come in here and I calm down. And it's like, I there's no my candles. There's nothing calm about that no. room. It's like metal shelving just stuffed with candles and like yeah it's just and michael be like somehow, james bond bonfire james somehow in the cloud of that smell and we, like you've been we've been in shops or where they have tons of candles all together and you just you can't they all smell the same jim is actually able to smell it and go that's fire <laughs> or like <laughs> and then that, that, that's what gives us that quote yeah that one, yeah Fire bonfire, James bonfire, Michael <gasps> This is like Michael be- feeling allowed to be silly at home for the first time. He's just mm-hmm. so excited. There's people that aren't Jan in the house. Mm-hmm. And, well, uh, and when Andy and Angela show up, uh, they add a little bit to it just by crowding what is a very small space. That living room is very small for them. And it also gives Michael someone to kind of perform for who isn't uh, Jan, because during the, the game of, I guess it's charades or celebrity, they, um, Jan tries to call Michael down. Yes. Oh, uh, whoa. So, yeah. <laughs> Just like, Simmer really, down. Really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and without really using a lot of words just she's just so she's good. just pure emotion in that moment both of That's their great. both of their like behavior is so extreme no matter what it is they're doing right even even my, jan my, trying to my be my like my, <laughs> my, my turn <laughs> even jan trying to calm him down is like you are clearly not calm <laughs> um that does lead to a couple of um fantastic improvised moments in this episode uh which is um like uh well uh, uh, well okay i guess i jumped a little bit but jan at one point turns on some music Did right? I and, stutter? <laughs> <laughs> it's been way too uh, long it always gets me mm. <laughs> yeah it felt good for me too <laughs> <laughs> Self to home. You stuttering fool. No, I'm kidding. 
What were the um, improvises, Sean? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of great improvised scenes that kind of happen in it, it, when they're hanging out in the living room all together. Jan turns on the uh, album by Hunter or The Hunted. Um, <laughs> That's right. And, and as she's like dancing to it, she grabs Jim's hand and is dancing. Like she just, uh, that, that's just a Melora Hardin. Uh, to pull off a little spin while so she's funny. sitting there. So funny. Amazing. And then, and then of course later when um, Michael and Jan are arguing and, and she's like, well, I guess I'm the devil. <laughs> and she puts her like uh, finger horns up. Like that was just a totally improvised moment. And Michael's like, she is, she's the devil. And this, and like, she's framed so perfectly in front of the fireplace. It's, it is, it's amazing to me that they didn't plan it. It's just. Crackling. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, and of course I, but, but I, I kind of skipped over charades. Um, Michael Scott not understanding the rules of charades. <laughs> Which she has an issue with. Jan has an issue that he doesn't get the rules. No names. Out. No rhyming. <laughs> like, okay, you're getting my head. <laughs> and and Jim not being cool at all. Jim being kind of mean to Michael. Like, yeah. just play the game, dude. Like, you're, you're <laughs> ah, <laughs> she's like, no, ah, ah. <laughs> You know what? I think I think Jim playing that. Uh, does anyone read the paper? I yeah. think Jim messing with Michael a little bit. It reminds me a lot of uh, in Cafe Disco when Angela is cleaning and they try, Michael tries to stop her and she says, am I not allowed to have any fun? I feel like that's Jim's natural reaction to right. just kind of mess with Michael just a little bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. If I'm being forced to sit through all this, then mm -hmm. I'm going to have a little fun. But it, the way he does it is, is great, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Dawson's then, Creek. And then he guesses Tom Cruise while he's trying to do Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it drives Michael. The sound he makes when he guesses Tom Cruise is the most <laughs> exasperated anyone gets on this episode. Oh, my God. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, well, Jim eventually makes it out uh, off to the bathroom and uh, decides, okay, like, um, we're out of here. And... Uh, fakes a text from his landlord that he's, his apartment is flooded. He's in that bathroom leaning on the sink like he's taking a break during a marathon. He's just like so exhausted already. <laughs> What's going on? He comes out and says, oh, like, I mean, he's even got a smile on his face as he's doing it, but he comes out and is like, like, oh, guys, worst news. I just got a text from my landlord. Like, my apartment's flooded. Pam? And Pam's just like her eyes widen and it's just like, oh my God, like it's it. over. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> and uh, and then Michael just so fast to be like, only one of you needs to do that. Snips they, it out. And Jim's just like, You're right. You're right. Pam. See it <laughs> <laughs> Which is just incredible because <laughs> You, it's the look that you, she gives Jim of just like, no, like you're not, you cannot do this to me. But this is, but this is another fantastic moment because it's like at that, it like, it's just kind of like one up, one up, one up. And like, Jim's like, all right, fine. I'm, I'll take it. I have to go. I will leave Pam behind. And then Pam uses her like understanding of Michael's logic, yes. like, like so quick to say, Jim, you can always buy new stuff, but you can't buy a new party. And Michael's just like, that's true. That's true. And just walks over and starts taking his coat off. It's We didn't talk about it in the Michael really? Pam episode last week, but that, that is an incredible moment in which mm -hmm. Pam weaponizes her relationship with Michael against Jim, which is Absolutely. a crazy thing we never it's see. It's brilliant. Really it's, it's a brilliant card to pull. And she, and she says it with confidence and loud enough to be like, like yep. no, you're uh, not. You know, in the booze cruise episode, Jim has that aside where he says, "You know what? I would save the receptionist," but he doesn't. He tries to save himself. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> uh, oh gosh. Uh, yeah, and throughout this whole time, like Andy and Angela, they don't they don't add a ton to like a lot of the scenes. I mean, they definitely have some lines here and there, but like, I think you're right. I think physically they crowd the room out. They're also kind of rounding out the main cast in in one room together and they eventually of course even get Dwight in there because how can you have this episode without Dwight, they, right? Angela and Andy really do contribute in very small ways Andy because he is so excited to be there and is such a willing participant 
in the games, in the investment opportunity. Uh, <laughs> Angela, too, her presence there rounds out when they go to the kitchen and Jan makes that sort of comment about Pam and Pam tries to deflect and says that she's never had any sort of interest in Michael. But then Angela is there to reinforce it by saying, I've seen yeah. the way you look at him. Yeah. So there's, there, there's kind of a team up element against Pam that makes it a little mm -hmm. bit harder for Pam versus Jan in this sort of your word versus mine. Uh, yeah. Andy, Andy and Angela are kind of this like chaotic neutral force just thrown into this uh, nightmare evening <laughs> that like, <laughs> Like they don't really know, like they're probably going to play along with Michael or Jay on the whole time. It's hard to say, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, that, I mean, that's a great moment that you bring up, like, <clears throat> and we've talked about it before too, but Jan, like thinking that Pam and Michael had a relationship before, and we've mentioned it before where we think that Michael only may have told Jan that out of like, uh, in the midst of an argument. Right, not mm -hmm. not really like bragging that he had gotten together with Pam, but maybe Jan was talking about, you know, Hunter one day, and he was like, well, uh, you know, Pam and I, blah blah blah, or something. Um, but uh, but this is something that's got gets brought up a lot in this episode. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> Pam mentioning like making a joke at Jim's expense. Like one time he helped me with my DVR, and I couldn't get audio for a while or something like that. And Michael's like, well, I'm always just a phone call away. And Jan's like, I bet you are. I bet you are. Yeah. And then and then Michael puts the coat on Pam at one point and Jan looks over. I am so sorry about the temperature in here. It's a really funny story about how the glass sliding glass door broke. You want to tell it, babe? I like <laughs> that story, babe. <laughs> and we see that we see the tarp over the uh, door earlier too we don't really see right. we don't they don't really mention it you guys do a little construction? Like, uh, yeah yeah um, um but of course then we learned that michael ran through a sliding glass door to catch an ice cream truck that's pretty remarkable <laughs> <laughs> and all the meanwhile uh again no dinner happening at, in this episode of dinner we got party. the oso buka three got hours buka, away three hour braise and uh as as pam says that's a lot to expect at a dinner party the, the you would just be able to eat the line that i laughed at actually the hardest re-watching this episode um was when pam goes up to get wine and, and jan says no we'll all go girls trip and then they're in the girls kitchen trip, girls and, trip. <laughs> and jan closes the oven and just says not even close yeah uh, not even <laughs> close <laughs> so good, there's brother. no end in sight that <laughs> Not even close. And then uh, Dwight smartly shows up with his own food. Let's talk about Fine. Dwight and uh, the woman. Yeah, throwing a new they surprise. Her name. That's right. We do not name. get her name, um, but she is um, her his babysitter. Her name is Beth Grant. Thank you, thank you. I had the page open somewhere here, but her name is Beth Grant. She's a great actress. I mean, what's funny is we were just watching. Uh, the speed together the other night, and she's in that movie. She's sure. the woman who tries to, well, not to give anything away, but she does. <laughs> she's the bus driver. It's okay. It's okay. That movie's from what ninety five. She played the bus. Yeah. Um, no, I mean she's a power. She's a powerhouse. She's in a, in a lot of great films, No Country for Old Men, and and uh, and several others. But uh, but yeah, she, <laughs> that moment between her and Jim, like, I have so many questions for you. What's your email address? what's email yeah what's your email address <laughs> the the comedy of, of just the cut to dwight eating by himself with the gigantic glass of wine filled all the way to the top all the way and, to the top and he just says to himself mm, good turkey leg good turkey leg <laughs> well, no one like, else is eating <laughs> they're like in shorter chairs too they see <laughs> and yeah, dwight's they had date, to pull out a couple extra dwight's ones. date just they're talking about beet salad with angela and Dwight State makes one very innocuous comment. It's actually really good. And Dwight, uh, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> I know you like beet salad. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know you love beet salad you many times. The Dwight, Andy, Angela dynamic is something that, it's not a side plot, but it is something that is folded in uh, within this episode as well. Just have them all in the same room and at right. the same table. Mm -hmm. um, there is something beautiful too about Dwight showing up because, um, you know, Michael tells... Dwight in the cold open, like couples only, 
and he says it a little bit coldly to him. But when Dwight shows up, Michael is actually so happy, which is interesting. Because <laughs> one of see. he's like one of my friends is here. Yeah. Uh, He's like, you said we didn't have enough wine glasses. Dwight brought his own wine glasses. And this tips the scales to Michael's favor. Sure. Whatever you want. (laughs) That's when we get snip, snap, snips. Oh, my God. That might be, yeah, that's one of the, another great improvised moment. Steve Carell saying snip, snap, snip, snap is an improvised line. Just, just, you have no idea. Physical toll. (laughs) What vasectomies have on a person? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Dwight really comes in and acts as a sort of savior in this episode. He's cast aside at the very beginning and he, and when he enters, uh, Pam says, yes, she's so excited or awesome. I think she says, yeah, awesome. yeah. she's so excited to see him. And, uh, yes, Purely Michael responds carnal, very positively to having Dwight to there. Yes. It's the last sort of ingredient that puts Jan over the top and causes that extra ingredient or that extra uh, argument between them that causes Jan to eventually throw the Dundee at the TV. Uh, mm-hmm. And then at the end, and not to jump to the end, but Dwight is the one who steps in and, and steps up to offer Michael a place to stay. What I was wondering, what I realized, house. yeah, that's right. <laughs> when, when, uh, when the police show up and, and Dwight takes uh, uh, Michael home to stay with him, um, of course, Michael reaches out to Jan and doesn't want to go home with him. Uh, but thankfully, Jim's house is flooded. Um, I that was that's a that's one of First those he says on fire. Or one of those, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And Pam reminds him, uh, but that's one of those scenes or one of those uh, like episodes that I would love to see is Michael and Dwight hanging out at the farm after that dinner party, right? I'm I was almost like I I, I imagine them like in bed together, <laughs> like staying up talking all night, like it's a sleepover. <laughs> like they do a night out with Ryan. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I love Michael with his head out the car window. <laughs> Just yeah. a sad puppy. <laughs> yeah. And then he's fast asleep later. <laughs> like when they cut to them again and Dwight sees uh sees Beth Grant at the uh bus stop and just yeah. keeps driving. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> The way Dwight interacts with the cops is so funny. He steps up and the cop just says, not now, Dwight. Yeah, and, then, know, know. and then at oh. the end, he puts his hand, I, I seem to misremember this is him putting his hand on Michael's shoulder, but he puts his hand on the cop's shoulder, which I, I love. It's really good. It's and, great. It's an ongoing joke that all the firefighters and policemen in Scranton seem to know, know Dwight, Dwight and are annoyed by it. They know him and they've had enough of him already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of uh i can think of like three times the cops are inter- interacting with characters from the office there's like when uh frame toby there's this um uh the delivery yeah when he puts the siren on his car yeah. you can't oh, impersonate the a police officer Dwight. Oh, sorry yeah. yeah and then of course the finale with when they take creed away but that's the fbi ah, so that yeah. doesn't count mm, yeah. not the Different Lackawanna department. county sheriff's department <laughs> Um, of course, though, we're, we, we jumped a little bit over the, the real over climax yes. of the episode, which is dinner itself. We get the, the Oso Buco is finally ready um, after uh, Michael uh, well tells Pam that he's a little worried that Jam might have poisoned the food. And then Pam realizes that if, if she was going to poison anyone, it might be Michael's former lover. Um, but we get Michael dipping, dipping his fork of Oso Buco into steak. the wine. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and uh, Jan's like, don't do that. Can you That's not do gross. that? It's disgusting. You know I have soft teeth. How could you say that? And it's just like, you. oh man. It's the way just, she does that. The like, malice with oops, yes. Is like Corella DeVille, like Disney villain level evil. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oof. And really then, good. She's so good. And, and like, they've just been building her up this entire time and she's just fully she's not even really trying to pretend to be a good host anymore she's just michael and jan are just taking shots at each other no and 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 the way michael turns that that scene around and then they're bathed in this sort of blue neon light from his saint paul and girl sign it just sets the table for this is where this episode is gone this is where they're all sitting around in silence while this beer sign just buzzes over them 
It's yeah, you can like hear it as yeah. well as see it. <laughs> and then, and then of course she stands up and throws the Dundee at the plasma screen TV and we get Michael like, that is a $200 plasma screen TV. <laughs> Good luck paying me back with your zero salary a year plus benefits, babe. And, um, and that's the one that she can't take. That's the comment that she can't take, which I think is a, um, is is a, is exactly gets to the core of Jan, which is what we know about Jan before this. She's a businesswoman. That's like all she wants to be. She wants to be taken seriously. She wants to be in charge. She wants to be in control. That's what she's trying to do with this dinner party, and she can't get it together. And when he reminds her that she's got no job, that's like that's when she is done. She can't take it anymore. And in, even though it, she goes upstairs, she comes back down and she's totally vulnerable at that point. She wants to stop fighting. She wants to apologize, all this stuff. Um, and I just thought that that was, I thought that that was great. I thought that that was the perfect line that he could have said to her, the way that it takes her down like that. There's another line that foreshadows that, you know, when, uh, they are talking about Michael's repeated and reverse vasectomies where Jan sort of acquiesces to wanting to have a kid and Michael says, do you mean it? And <laughs> right. Jan, Jan says under her breath, I hate my life and walks away. Oof. It's very easy to miss. It's very subtle, but yeah. Yeah. It leads Things into that moment. Well in the Scott condo. Mm -hmm. We'll say that. And the other big moment from dinner is Michael's, uh, the, the exchange between Michael and Jan about the candles and being an artist. They kind of go back and forth with each other. They're passive well, aggressive. Well, I'm a screenwriter, but you yeah. don't see me bragging about it. <laughs> <laughs> Their passive aggression becomes just straight out aggression. It, well, it crosses the line. Because she says, at least he's an artist in reference to Hunter. And Michael mm -hmm. says, BF, it does, it, does it BFD. Up, uh, BFD again. BFD, I'm a screenwriter. <laughs> and then Jan yells, and I'm a candle maker, but you don't hear me bragging about it. Oh, yeah. Exactly what she's basically doing. No, all you do is get me to try to work on my rich friends. Burn investment opportunity. <laughs> Boy, oh, yeah. I'd love to burn your candles. <laughs> His rich friends who are his employees. <laughs> That's how Michael sees them, I guess. But he, like, oh my gosh, we do I, get... think, I think that is the climax of the episode, though, right? Is when she throws the Dundee. That's is that when it peaks? I think it's what that's what she said. The, the <laughs> perfect combination of anger and self expression. You're hardly my Michael. first. Yeah. Yes. That's what she you burn it, you buy it. He looks at the camera with his arms up yeah. and says to the world, <laughs> That's what she said. That, and that's when she just has had enough and turns around and throws the bendy. Oh my gosh, I know. Well, it's like, I mean, Jan is up against everybody in this episode, isn't she? I mean, Jan versus Michael, Jan versus Pam, Jan versus Dwight, Jan versus everybody's perception of Jan. She doesn't, she is just constantly on the defense or on the attack. Yeah. It, Even when she rushes out to see Michael talking to the police, she says, Michael, what are you doing to him? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, yeah, she's like, after the police now. The show, the show has spent three seasons, you know, telling you what Michael really wants, basically, of like, I want to live in a home with a wife and have kids. And ostensibly on the surface, he has everything. And then this episode, just you just get to go inside. And it's just, you're, it is these two... It's a predator circling their prey, Jan being the predator and Michael trapped in this house and neither of them are getting what they want. And it, the whole entire time is just this absolute explosion of self-hatred between the two of them. And <laughs> then like it's it's like a competition. Right, right. And, and it is like, they just, that is what they want, right? They just want normalcy. They want to have a dinner party and show people their home and all this stuff. And it's just like, yeah. It's, yeah, it's tragic. <laughs> it's a tragic. It's an absolute tragedy. It's absolutely tragic. It's really dark. The whole episode's really dark. And the realism with the way they can't stand each other is like done in a way that's, that, that's what makes it really cringy to, cringy to watch sometimes is there's things going on and there's like, you watch it and you're like, oh man, there's, I had a fight that was similar or I felt this way about someone before and it, it kind of bubbles up when you watch right. that show. That's what makes it so cringy. I think the candle is the perfect metaphor where 
they take them into their home and they go into the candle studio and on the surface it all looks very beautiful and well done but the candle room smells terrible they can smell mm. that everything's not right and it starts with these there are little candles all over the room but by the end it becomes a james bonfire right. <laughs> well uh, said what were what were some of your other uh, was there any moments in this episode that we didn't talk about that, that, uh, yeah, no, we spent like 40 minutes talking about a 20 minute episode. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Pretty good. Well, we're breaking rules here. Uh, one thing that did not come up, that doesn't come up in the episode, but was written and then was kind of axed, was uh, within the dinner party, there was this sort of side story with uh, something happening to a neighbor's dog. So in the deleted scenes, they talk about how they mentioned at the beginning how somebody had spray painted a swear word on a neighbor's dog while oh, Jan was geez. on neighborhood watching and fallen asleep oh, and then gosh. later at the end she says it was me with no prompting and talks about how she spray painted the neighbor's dog and then at the end well the neighbors come out to see what's going on the dog is there with the word blurred out on the side of it oh my goodness um, but oh the original gosh. sort of way that was written was that uh somebody hit the dog with their car and that also ended up being jam and you know it's funny this gives me the perfect opportunity to show you my little script of dinner party that i have Oh my God! What? What? How do you have that? What is it, that? It came with the, that? it came with the DVD when I bought it. Oh I've my had gosh. it forever, and I dug it's, it up. It's, it's little. Yeah, it's tiny, but like you can see, it has all the stage directions and stuff. And oh, the, dude. the original cold open that's written in here is the where Michael gets gum in his hair, and Dwight puts peanut butter in it. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of little extra stuff that doesn't make it into the episode or the deleted scenes, but yeah, this I've had this forever. There's like a coffee stain on the bottom. Like, it's just, I've just kept it with me all these years. But oh my this gosh! Is the, it's all, the little I know it was all leading up to this moment. Oh, that's, that's amazing! Beautiful. Oh, nice. so cool. Nice one. There's yeah. one. I mean, one thing that I want one last moment to talk about is the end when we see Jan gluing back together uh, or gluing the Dundee back together. That part's kind of a weird end. Cause, sad because so many things have have happened and we're left with a little bit of hope for Jan at the end, a little bit that, okay, she's maybe, maybe she's sobered up a bit or calmed down and she's like, wants to make things right. Nothing really happens. We don't really see much happen with that. Right. They're, no, because they're done after this episode, pretty much. There, there are a number of moments at the end of this episode that sort of help redeem is the wrong word but it kind of helps bring it back into a positive direction jan showing that little bit of um i guess you would call it remorse by trying to fix the dundee dwight stepping up to give michael a place to stay the sort of the humor that jim and pam kind of find together uh she stole really the helped. cd, pam yeah, stole the CD. They, they, there's like a there's a warmth to it at the end of that episode that helps kind of when mm -hmm. angela smashes yeah. the ice cream cone on the side of the car it just <laughs> leaves you with a warm fuzzy feeling hope for their relationship you wonder like if they did this episode in the bbc office it would just end with the police escorting michael away and mm -hmm. really dark and it would just go to credits and it'd just be like, oh my God, that was so terrible. <laughs> what <I> becomes <laughs> of you, my love? <laughs> yeah. I do love the part where the police, he's talking to the police officer and, and uh, he's like, uh, the police officer's like, well, do you want to press charges? Or he's like, a girl, my girlfriend threw a Dundee at my plasma screen TV. Uh, at my, you know, he goes, <laughs> she's, it's like, you want to press threw a Dundee at my TV, plasma. <laughs> he qualifies TV. <laughs> Well, do you want to press charges? Oh God, will she get in trouble? She'd be charged. <laughs> the guy, the expression that that guy makes when he says Michael that. Michael says, no, I'll take the fall. I did <laughs> yeah. It. He like, just assumes like, that mm -hmm. someone has to you get You just be a little quieter. <laughs> yeah, just do that, yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. The other little moment I love is uh, when Michael points out the little table that he's made. Yeah, and he pine says, or Nordic it's, either, cherry. it's either pine or Nordic cherry. <laughs> And, uh, and and Jim says, like, like oh, man, no, I love this stuff. And, like, and, and, or, and no, Jan he, looks at him and he's like, uh, like, really? <laughs> like, yeah, he says, I'm just no good with this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and, it, and almost, Jan's, like, it almost impresses Jan. of like, oh, my, Jim? Like, Michael's impressing this? Jim? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, no, he's just talking. <laughs> there's, an, there's another line from, I want to say it's the deposition where uh, Jan says, you know, people don't give Michael enough credit. There are many things that he's above average at. Yes. Ice skating, for one. <laughs> he's a very, he's a very good, good ice, ice skater. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, that's a, that's another thing that we just maybe haven't mentioned yet is that the, the episode before this is the deposition and we get like the final moment of that episode is Jan being like, this will all work out and I'll stay home and I'll wear sweatpants and I'll wait for you to come home at five o'clock. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> we, and then we, and then really when this aired, you know, then we didn't get to see them for four months. I mean, now when you watch it on Netflix, it's back to back, but. Um, so it did kind of feel like, uh, like, uh, gosh, they there, should there, have just been going more of, and more crazy yeah. this whole time. There was a lot of dirty laundry they had to air out over four mm. months that had been building in that house. And it's, it's hard to see. It's like for this episode, so great of putting Michael in that role where he's obviously such an inappropriate, bad and, and terrible boss most of the time. But for some reason, we still feel endeared to him. And this whole episode is Jan just kind of beating him up and kind of bullying Michael. And it just does such a good job of being like, Michael has, he's so harmless, even though he's completely obnoxious and he's completely reckless. Well, he's not yeah. really that harmless. And Jan is a truly harmful person. This is what a really harmful person looks like. And putting them in stark contrast and Michael is just the baby. And it, right. it, that's how the entire episode plays out. I think... One of the differences is that within the context of this dinner party, Michael cares about everyone who's attending the dinner party, including Dwight. And on the flip side, Jan doesn't really care about anyone who's attending. Not at all. No. She doesn't she, really hold them in high regard or want to be friends with them in any sort of meaningful way. It's part of her living out this domestic scenario that they've created together, mm -hmm. uh, maybe well-intentioned, but clearly not uh, <laughs> in anyone's best interest. She wants investment in well, Serenity by Jan. I mean, it's like it's like when it's like when uh, Michael's uh, when they're talking about uh, the Dundies or the trophies, and he's like, "Well, Jan, you're the only trophy I'll ever need, babe." And she, Aww. <laughs> she loves that. It's like, well, this is I guess this is what the image that she's trying to recreate for herself, and uh, and uh, it, it did. I don't know if it. I don't think it worked out. <laughs> Well, um, it, any, any final thoughts? I have one thing, and this was on, I posted this on Twitter as far as our Twitter account. I mean, I do, I tweet sometimes, but our Twitter's not the most high traffic thing that we do for our page. But I did put, our most popular tweet was when I, I just posted the statement and it was a statement. I said, let's be clear about one thing, dinner party, is the funniest op ep episode of The Office, not the best. Yeah. And that got a lot of divisive, that a lot of people had strong opinions on Whoa. that. Someone posted just the gif of Michael mm -hmm. going, don't like that at all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and other people, like other people were posting like the thank you. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we, had, we got a whole like pretty divided response. Oh, so, that's cool. I, so mm -hmm. now that we've talked about it, do you guys agree with my, that is what I believe. Do you guys agree with that? I think that ugh. it's a strong contender. It's <laughs> for me. It it's goes the funniest. It goes deeper than the funny. Funniest. It for me. Yeah. It goes deeper than funny. I think that. I mean. I think that. I look at dinner party and the things that stand out to me are the character development of Jan and the relationship between Jan and Michael and just how how well constructed it is and how we've kind of watched it build to this um, breaking point. Uh, and uh, while, while the, the jokes are hilarious and everything, it's like the, the strategies that all the characters are using against each other. And, and it's really like, I mean, it is what I love about The Office. It is, it is definitely what I love the office it's the other the other funny thing is that it's easily it's easily one of the funniest and it's easily one of the best but i can see how you wouldn't necessarily call it the best because there are other episodes that maybe stand out in, in different ways mm -hmm. i don't i think i kind of think stress relief is the funniest episode mm. yeah but yeah. here's the thing yeah. that has the advantage of being to, a two-parter with the fire at the beginning and the roast at the end right with Michael feeding birds whole slices of bread somewhere in the middle. So it's a, diff it's a difficult thing to pit against each other. But I, I think, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's, a, it's such a fun thing to think about. Yeah. I will say that I think it has the strongest performances. I think it is the episode with the strongest performances, especially from Laura Hardin. But also, I mean, just, just the dynamic between her and Steve Carell and 
um, you know, this. Yeah, yeah. It's just there's just not enough Dwight in it to be the best. That's, that's a good point. That's that's as simple as I can make <laughs> that's it. That's a good point. It's not enough Dwight. Yeah, but let us know how you feel about that. If you yeah. got that statement, send us uh, different memes encapsulating your responses. <laughs> yeah. That's your on feelings. our Twitter. Go, go yeah. find that tweet and mm-hmm. leave, us a, leave us a reaction. You can just send us the subject line, my reaction to dinner party, and then in just an attached GIF. That, mm-hmm. That's enough. It's well, the funniest, um, not the best. Um, oh, my gosh. Well, dinner party, obviously one of the most iconic episodes of all time. Yes. Um, I think that uh, we'll, we'll, we're never going to stop talking about it on this show. We'll continue to reference it and all this stuff. But uh, I loved it. I love deep diving with you guys on that one. Uh, but let's, uh, it's time for a little conference room. Okay, everybody, listen up. If you are not in that conference room in two minutes, I am going to kill you. Okay, so for this week's conference room segment, we are going to talk about something that just happened the other day. It was a uh, mini office reunion, courtesy of John Krasinski and the Some Good News program. Um, he, while on the show, they uh, held a, a, a virtual wedding for this nice couple, and uh, in the end, uh, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, uh, they, <laughs> they bring in everyone from the cast and they play uh, Forever by Chris Brown, and they all do that, they all do the dance together. Um, and it's a moment that kind of picked up a lot of traffic online, and uh, it's the closest thing we've had to an office reunion, especially that it includes Steve Carell, um, yeah. within the last few years. So uh, I just kind of wanted to talk about it. How did you guys feel? Did you like it? I mean, yeah, it's amazing that everybody, I think, I think the only two people who aren't in it are Toby and, um, Stanley. I Stanley. Say Stanley. Yeah. And Daryl. Oh, and no Daryl. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, we've even got no Aaron. Jan, no Nate. No, no yeah, I mean, we no Cat. <laughs> yeah. no, no, Hank no. was in there. Pump okay. the brakes. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, no Joe Bennett. <laughs> Anyway, you, anyway, what, anyway, anyway, I, uh, I, I thought, really, yeah. I really appreciated this. I thought it was yeah. uh, really nice, very sweet, very nice for that couple. They do the whole nice dance thing. to the Chris yeah. Brown song. Most that... of them do the moves they did down the aisle in some mm-hmm. form too. Uh, certainly, yeah, Oscar Oscar's with doing his... his weird geometrical dance. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy kind of doing the back shuffle, a little Nard Dog shuffle. Dwight with the kick. Um, Dwight with the full kick. Yeah. Kicking his, his Rain Wilson kicking his own wife in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Not Isabel, like it is in, uh, right. In, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. What if, you, what if you gotten that actress to come over just for that scene? To <laughs> breaking quarantine. Just he would have been, kick her in the face. he would have been publicly shamed for that. For sure. Um, but <laughs> it's just oh. that song, that scene of all the ones we could have an office reunion for. Yeah. It had to be that one. Of course. Uh, I understand why they did this. I oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pre- okay. your pitchforks. <laughs> let me let me preface let me preface with what what I'm about to say. Okay. Yeah. Because I after I saw the video, I, I saw it on Reddit on uh, Dun- Dunder Mifflin subreddit. I think is what it's called. But um, I had I sat there and I read through the comments and nobody agreed with. <laughs> okay, so before I say it, I know that this is an unpopular opinion, but even when they did this dance the first time on The Office, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't like this is not that good of a song by preach, Chris, preach, by John. Chris Brown, preach, preach, Chris Brown, like who is not a good person and would, it's just, not like, a good not that scene, I don't like his music, song. but. but we're, and yeah. then and then it's like it was it was it's not uniquely the office right this is actually something that some oh, other yes. very clever people came up with and they did it at their wedding and then the the joke in the office is that they just copied it but yes but the people producing the office just copied it mm-hmm. <laughs> so i've never been okay with this scene and i I will skip it when rewatching Niagara. And, um, you know, I just think I, I'm, I would have taken no reunion <laughs> over it. In my mind, I just want to kind of like move on from, it. I mean, what, I mean, just as an alternative, right? I know that this would have been harder to do, but what if we had written a BJ Novak and Mindy Kaling write a script for one comp one zoom conference room that Michael is leading or something like that that we go back in time before 
as if as if he never moved to Colorado, as if nothing ever happened. Like we've kind of talked about before, the reunion that that I might like to see is is kind of just pretending it's like an alternate universe. We're still at Dunder Mifflin Spring, but you know, they have to Zoom call for coronavirus quarantine or something like that. Um, I mean, Parks and Rec. I mean, I gotta. I I haven't watched it, but Parks and Rec did a scripted zoom reunion um, I, I didn't see the parks and rec one i haven't watched it i i was nervous to watch it but now after seeing the office one <laughs> it's, it's nice to see the whole it's check nice it to out. see the cast in one place um in, in in some ways it just was an upsetting reminder of what what will never be again you know but see so you, you didn't care for it either no, no, I didn't mind it. I, I feel pretty neutral about it. I was like, oh, that's cute. Like, it, it, honestly, at the end of the day, it's a really awesome thing they did for that couple. And that yeah. makes it great, you know. As far as a separate piece of, like, office office canon, it's like this reunion or them doing that scene of all that's like, oh, we're coming back to reunion. We're going to do Michael and Holly's proposal again. I'd be like, oh, are you kidding me? Any other scene can we redo, please? Mm. So I feel See, that I'm, way, too. With, I'm glad with the you – oh, sorry. No, that's it. Um, I'm glad you came in a neutral because I'm pro. I really liked it. I thought it was great. I mean, I think the song is fine. I mean, I'm not going to defend Chris Brown or anything, but I thought the moment was nice. Like, uh, yeah. and I enjoyed it when it happened. And you know what? I thought it was the perfect amount of reunion because if we're being honest, it's probably the most rare we're going to get. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's true. I, I don't think, I mean, it's fun to think about what a scripted sort of Zoom thing would feel like in a vacuum. But the way that The Office ended with sending off all the characters, it doesn't really make it seem like it's that possible because you'd have to stitch together all the continuity and like yeah. put it all back yeah. together. And I actually kind of felt like when I was watching it, it was like, it's clear that these are just, you know, these are celebrities stepping back in for a moment. Yeah. Uh, and it only needed to be a minute long. I don't think it needed to be any longer. I think it's it's funny because when you watch it on YouTube, one thing I will say is if when you watch it on YouTube, they do a great job of cutting between characters, mm -hmm. just like like they do in the montage in the in the episode. But if you were on gallery view in Zoom and you were just watching them all do that for like two minutes, like it would be it would be kind of strange. Yeah, um, bizarre. And and but, not to yeah. mention that it doesn't seem like it actually was done as a Zoom meeting, right? I mean, it's like the the way that the the, I, I think mean, they, 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 they shot. I, I uh, they the couple was watching it live, but um, I think they filmed these segments separately, right? It wasn't all happening live for them. Um, yeah, you know, just kill the magic. That's cool. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want. Like, I mean, magic. the thing is, no, no, no. Everybody, just, look, hey, no, hey. I don't want to do that. I don't want to kill the magic. All right, As, no, and, and really, for fine. me, I get a kick out of talk. I get a kick out of talking crap it's, sometimes. So of course, <laughs> it's, I'm, it's, I'm not trying to be rude, but because yeah. because I'm gonna tell you something too. For for even like even though in my mind I was like, oh god, here we go. I I had ear to ear smile when I was watching this on the yes. toilet this morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why you didn't um, like it. Just thinking about how I was going to rip into it on this podcast. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think the other thing too is that we're we're members of you know different office like fan groups on social media, right. and it's it can be kind of tough to watch the comments and people tend to shoot other people down around what their opinions are and that kind of thing. And I think Stupid. one thing that I like about this show or what are our conversations because we're all you know we're all friends is that like. I, I love that you can have that opinion and people will agree or disagree. I will kind of lean towards the more positive side because I know that you might, you know, have that contradicting opinion. So we can kind of talk about it uh, and find what there is in the middle, you know? So uh, <laughs> don't be afraid to, you know, yeah. I uh, leave it yourself. It was nice seeing everybody again. Steve Carell somehow gets hotter and hotter. And, uh, and uh, man, Oscar Dina is 61 years old, man. He's looking great too. Wow. Um, like I like just peering at Kate Flannery looks fantastic. Oh yeah, I, I, she's I mean, coming off Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, I liked just little glimpses of everyone's houses. Just like, oh wow, like Oscar's got a great little vista on that patio. I'm liking yeah. that. Um, Ed Helms has a lot of hair right now. A lot of hair right now. Very yeah. different uh, quarantine haircut from mine. Wayne Wilson's but... got a great kitchen. Yeah, yeah. it's nice <laughs> just seeing that. Stuff. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, it's like they didn't do this to make an office reunion. They did it to do a cute thing for a couple. Right. You know, that's it. If right. they were going to, if they said, Hey, this is the office reunion, here it is. 
then it would be like, oh, that, okay, fine, whatever. But it was as far as within the context of SGN and the cast doing something nice for someone in this day and age right now, it was, it was pretty awesome. I thought it was cool. It was cool of them to do it. And it was, it was a fun little treat to, to wake up to. Sure was. Um, so, uh, well, okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Sean, what's next? Some trivia. All right, guys, I made trivia for this week. I just, uh, I just grabbed trivia from season, random trivia from season five. Perfect. No real thing to it. I love random trivia. It's my favorite. Just jumping around. Um, so let's dive right into this here from, from Baby Shower, from the cold open and the watermelon birth. Uh, fill in the blank on this quote from Dwight. Babies are one of my many areas of expertise. Growing up, I blank. I was one. No? I can guess, though. Babies okay. are one of my expertise. Babies are one of up. my many areas of expertise. Growing up, <laughs> comma, I performed. Oh, my own, cir- my own circumcision? <laughs> yes, oh. my own circumcision. Oh, my gosh. Very good. Uh, also from Baby Shower. When Pam is telling Jim all about her art school classmates over the phone, and he can't follow along, what is the wrong name that Jim thinks is the teaching assistant in Pam's class? Sarah Kaya comes in. Excellent. Very and good. And then at the end, Dwight's like, Dwight who's Sarah Kaya comes in? I've always thought that would be a great trivia team that's name. A, that's a deep one. <laughs> who's, Sarah, who's Sarah Kaya comes in? Uh, Stacey's Lex- a boy. Yes. <laughs> no, Stacey's a boy. <laughs> she could get arrested. Uh, from Lecture Circuit, part two. When Angela, Oscar, Kevin, and Meredith are watching Angela's cats on her webcam. Which cat is humping Princess Lady? Oh, Mr. Ash. Mr. Ash, yes, very oh, good. Wow. Also from Lecture Circuit Part 2, we see Pam use five mnemonic devices for the Nashua branch staff members after Michael melts down and she takes over. What are those five names we hear? Holly's boyfriend's one. Yes. Uh, Katie Lang. Katie Lang, yes. Penguin. Penguin, yes. <laughs> I, I can't think of the other two. I don't two. know what the other two are. One of them is Blazer, oh. and the other is Freckles. Okay. Blazer, Freckles. That's tough. Penguin, pretty mon- pretty Lang, mundane. Holly's boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Sorry. <laughs> Miss Click. <laughs> Miss Click. Uh, from Blood Drive, what's Bob Vance's high score in bowling? He says, raise your hand here, anyone who's bowled over. 280? 280, yes, on the Woo! nose. Nice one. But also anyone who's bowled o- under, under 70. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You love, love to bring, bring up that, up that, one, that time. one time. <laughs> and the winner. And the winner. <laughs> and the winner. 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to make some Bob Vance uh, drops. Hey, yeah. Uh, another fill in the blank, also from Blood Drive from kevin my worst breakup was with stacy it was a sunday morning we were reading the paper and i said mm-hmm. I, I think the eagles might win the afc east clench oh, clench close, clinch. Close. oh my god i think the eagles could clinch the nfc east. oh the nfc east wow right. that's Got embarrassing that's now. embarrassing it's okay <laughs> it's okay uh from heavy competition and she said we're done we're done <laughs> 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 From heavy competition, Dwight compares Michael's reign as manager to four different historical eras and places. Can you name what those are? What episode is it? I'm From heavy competition. And he says, when Michael was in charge, this place was like the blank. And he wild, gets, wild west. Wild west is one of them. Uh, it was like, oh, it's like Think pre-war, big pre-war Russia. Russia, pre-war Russia or something like that. Close. close. Czars or something like that. Biggest empire in history. Ottoman Empire. The Roman the British Empire. Empire. Yeah. The Roman Empire. <laughs> the show, Empire. This place is like the Roman Empire and the Wild West and mm-hmm. war-torn Poland. War-torn Poland. Ugh. He says, and war-torn Poland. And Poland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, last question here. From Cafe Disco, what kind of oil does Dwight use to treat Phyllis's back pain? Um from an animal the oil of an otter good yes. grease yes from the gland of an otter yeah very good and she Said says i grease. can't lay here for an hour whoa whoa whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> the open the, the way he feeds that carrot to her open, <laughs> open palm <laughs> 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 
They said Diamond Dancer would never <laughs> race again. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rattles Alex. Are much scary. I don't mind the rattle. I find them soothing. <laughs> just the conversation they're having. <laughs> Oh, you guys, thank you, Alex, for that excellent trivia. And thank you all for listening. Please send us your questions and your comments. We want to hear your opinions on Dinner Party. The phone number is 503-694-9314. You can call us and leave us a message. We'd like to play them on the show. You can email us, mspodcastcompany at gmail.com. And we're on Facebook and Instagram, Michael Scott Podcast Company. We're on Twitter at Michael Scott Pod. And we have a website, michaelscottpod.com. Special thanks to Ryan Lloyd who helps us with our social media and does our all our artwork. And this episode was recorded in our various homes in Portland, Oregon. Say it every time. Thank you so much for listening. We love and appreciate every single one of you. Please remember to rate and review the show. It uh, helps us help people find the show. Uh, and above all, you know, stay safe. Uh, take care. Be well. Bibbidi poppy, give me the zap. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Threat level who? Michael's gone. Threat level why? Apartheid. Gotta fight it. Free Mandela. Peace, I'm out.